At around 4.35 p.m. on November 2nd, 2018, 40-year-old Scott Paul Bierley would leave the Tallahassee Suburban Extended Stay Hotel and headed over to the Hot Yoga Studio in Tallahassee, Florida. Although the hotel was a four-minute drive, he wouldn't arrive until 40 minutes later at 5.15 p.m. It isn't clear what he did during those 40 minutes. Eventually, when he arrived, he signed up for the 5.30 p.m. class. His movements following this are what can only be described as erratic. At 5.35 p.m., Scott entered the relatively quiet yoga session. He was told to put his items in a safe place outside, to which he did. He then re-entered. Upon re-entering, he looked at the yoga instructor, said, I have a question, and then began firing indiscriminately. The news right now just coming in. Two people shot dead while practicing yoga in Tallahassee. This is brand new video from the scene from just moments ago. Police say that shooter took his own life after opening fire. Four others are now in the hospital at this hour with gunshot wounds. Authorities have yet to identify the killer or release a potential motive here. Democratic hopeful for Governor Andrew Gillum is canceling his campaign events tonight so he can return to Tallahassee where he is the mayor. In a world where personal data is scattered across the digital landscape, regaining control has never been more critical. Unbeknownst to you, while you're watching this video, data brokers are busy selling your information. To them, you're just a statistic, and they care only about exploiting your data. To make matters worse, attempting to confront them and exercise your right to remove your information can take years, with no guarantee of locating all broker entities. But fear not, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Enters our friend and today's sponsor, Incogni. Incogni is here to help you take back control of your data. Say goodbye to spam emails from random companies, targeted ads, cold calls, and believe it or not, stalking. Yes, you heard that right stalking. According to Incogni, data broker agents go to great lengths to stalk your social media profiles. Crazy, right? Now, when I say these data brokers target everyone, I mean everyone, myself included. I recently signed up to Incogni. I gave them the rights to work on my behalf. And over this past week or so, they've sent 48 requests out, with 22 of those being completed. Within 24 hours, ladies and gentlemen, six of those 22 had already been completed. That's how quick Incogni works. Also, nine data brokers have added me to a suppression list, meaning they'll no longer collect, trade, or store information about me. So, if you're tired of prying eyes invading your private life and want to end those inconvenient calls during moments with loved ones, then it's time for you to sign up to Incogni today. Let them assist you in your mission to take back control of your data. And for all 8 Poncho viewers, there's a whopping 60% off if you use my code 8 Poncho at checkout today. Just visit www.incogni.com slash 8 Poncho to secure this huge discount. Always stay curious, stay safe, and remember, with Incogni, you're the one pulling the strings. Remember to visit www.incogni.com slash 8 Poncho to claim your 60% discount when you sign up today. There's little to no early life information about Scott other than he was born into a middle class family in 1978. The family of five lived as any other church going middle class American family did at that time. Both of his parents were office workers. Locals remember the boys as sweet kids. There were no red flags during Scott's childhood, nothing to suggest he would go on to become a dark, disturbed, evil individual. As a child, he earned badges as a boy scout, worked as a paperboy, mowed lawns for his neighbours, and served as an acolyte at his Methodist church. So, where did this behaviour start then? How do you go from a loving child to a monster that goes on to take lives? Well, for that, we'll have to fast forward to the 90s.
1993, when Scott was 15, he had been targeted by a group of females during his economics class. He later described this bullying as the origin of his misogynistic way of thinking. Following the incident, the way he acted around females was both inappropriate and dangerous. Around this time, he also started to hold racist and anti-Semitic views. He didn't keep these hidden. He would randomly blurt out speeches in front of the class before being told off or removed entirely. In 1995, Scott wrote four novels and a screenplay. This included a 70,000 word, 81 page novel titled Rejected Youth. This one stood out from the rest as it depicted a middle school boy who turns into a serial killer. The boy in the novel hates his female classmates who had shunned and humiliated him. The boy criticizes the girls' appearances, mocks their boyfriends, and becomes enraged by the girls' lack of respect for him. In the end, he murders them one by one. The thing was though, they weren't just random people. They were real depictions of Scott's classmates. The same group of girls who had targeted him two years earlier. Over the next 23 years, there were at least 12 known red flag incidents. Each incident depicts Scott's journey into depravity. Had authorities properly intervened during some of these incidents, then maybe the events that unfolded in November of 2018 would never have taken place. After leaving high school, Scott made his way over to the West Coast to pursue his dream of becoming a screenwriter. Ultimately, those dreams would crumble, he wouldn't make it. And so he moved back to the East Coast to live with his parents. Even though he didn't make it as a scriptwriter, he continued to write dark, violent, and misogynistic scripts and songs. Once he settled back in, he enrolled in a local college and found himself a part-time job at an insurance call center. However, they fired him soon after as he behaved inappropriately towards a female work colleague at a gym outside of work. The victim called police but didn't press charges. Over a three-week period beginning in October of 2002, a series of murders dubbed the DC Sniper Attacks took place in Washington, DC, claiming the lives of 17 people. A then 41-year-old former US Army sniper John Allen Muhammad and 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo, who looked to John as a father figure, went on to murder in a twisted plot to murder John's wife. They wanted to make it seem as if she was randomly murdered. Living in the area at the time of the murders, none other than Scott Paul Bierley. He had moved to Washington DC for an undergraduate internship. Due to the nature of Scott's writings in the form of scripts and songs, many in his family thought he carried out the attacks. They nearly came forward and gave police his name, but in the end, they never did. During his time in Washington DC, he stayed at a shared home. Roommates don't have the fondest of memories. On one occasion, one of them asked if he had a girlfriend. He replied, she's locked in my basement as we speak. The interaction would inspire Scott to create the song, Locked in My Basement, a story about a man who drugs, chains, and tortures a woman in his basement after she rejects his advances. I saw you out I knew that I would fail in any approach Any introduction would meet with reproach So I stood And even after an hour My lust had grown So I slipped you hypno When the opportunity shone Then the wave I moved in when I 
I saw you were visibly drowsy. And I carried you out saying you were feeling lousy. Now she's locked in my basement, she'll never say a word. When she screams out in terror, she cannot be heard. Oh, one day I know that she will learn to By 2006, Scott had found employment as a teacher in English and Social Studies in Maryland County. For a period of roughly four years leading up to 2006, no red flag incidents occurred. However, that was all due to change. You see, Scott was investigated by police after a student came forward to say that his behaviour towards her was inappropriate. He touched my arm looked into my eyes and asked if I'd ever posed for Playboy. He also suggested that I should wear low-cut shirts. Although the incident was investigated, no charges were ever brought forward, and he was allowed to teach until the end of 2007 before resigning for unknown reasons. In 2008, Scott joined the US Army as a supply and logistics officer. He's told he'll serve time in Germany. However, just two years later, he was honorably discharged for unacceptable conduct. This came as the result of inappropriate contact with female soldiers. A year after being discharged from the army, Scott enrolled in graduate school at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. His behavior continued to elicit concern. For example, he would make inappropriate comments towards his roommate's girlfriends when they came over. It got to a point where the girls opted to head straight to their boyfriend's rooms when they came over, avoiding the living areas in the property. Even some male friends didn't stay in the same room as him if they were by themselves. He was very weird and made everyone uncomfortable. It worried me at the time. There was concern for sure, but there wasn't enough evidence. And I would have been wasting the police's time if I had made any kind of report. I had nothing. We compared him to Ted Bundy. It's the way he lurked and followed girls. On December 7th, 2012, Scott was finally arrested on two counts of misdemeanor battery. The arrest came as the result of him grabbing two women's backsides at a Florida State University dining hall in November of 2012. His behavior had finally caught up with him. It was time to face the music. However, the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence. Scott graduated from Florida State University with two master's degrees just months after the charges were dropped. He secured one degree in public administration, the other in urban and regional planning. It isn't clear what Scott went on to do following his graduation, but what we do know is that another red flag incident occurred less than one year later. Believe it or not, Scott returned to the university campus and followed a volleyball coach around at the gym. For that incident, he was issued a trespass warning. Only a week later, he returned once again to look for the coach. This time around, he was arrested before he could even reach the gym. For the incident, he was ordered to complete a misdemeanor diversion program and a work program, which he did. He was also banned from the Florida State University campus. In 2014, a YouTube channel was created under the name Scott Carnifex. 
On the channel, Scott posted 17 rant-style videos covering various topics, such as why he became a misogynist, his many failed first dates, anecdotes about his time in the army, including an alleged girl he met while on tour, why he blamed television for establishing male sexual expectations, why he hated the police, along with other racist rants. Although 16 videos have been recovered from internet archives, one was missing plight of the adolescent male. During the video, he speaks about retribution, citing the Isla Vista mass shooting. The shooting, for those of you who aren't aware, was carried out by Elliot Roger, an incel who murdered six people and injured 14. He was angered about his inability to have a romantic or sexual relationship with women. I feel a compulsion now to discuss and address the origins of my misogynism and, and the rebirth <clears throat> and when it was reborn. <clears throat> nobody, <coughs> nobody emerges out of the womb one particular way or viewing or seeing one particular group of people one particular way. It, it occurs over a source of accumulated experiences, or maybe it's one perpetual individual. I know a girl when I was teaching that hated her mom, and uh, <clears throat> she was kind of a, I, what did she, well, that's a whole other story. But entering adolescence, I had the same goals and objectives and expectations, really, I think, as anybody, as any uh, tweener, is that the word, is that the term? <clears throat> I would say the, the origins really derive in, in eighth grade. Eighth grade home ec class. And I know there's a movie called uh, Mean Girls, but that's girls being, I think, mean to other f females. You, you've never, s if you haven't seen the will that a group of females can generate when they target anyone, be it an, an adult male or a, or a classmate or, or anyone. It's not just fellow classmates. It can be a grown man. Uh, I remember when I was in, in, in teacher college, one of my, we were, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And this one, talking about treachery, the, uh, one of my professors was relating the story of a teacher he knew and he'd given piano lessons to, to some girl and she'd made some baseless allegations, but you can't confirm, but you can't deny, but he fought them for years and years. This, this adolescent female that conceived of all it takes is apparently, and I talked about this before, if you offend their sensibilities, they can justify anything. And this one particular student lodged these allegations, and this grown man that should never have had to deal with this, fought it for years and years. Finally, the, the female, once she became an adult, realized she was doing the wrong thing by perpetuating this lie and admitted it. Um, but the target of their collective treachery can be anyone. In, in this particular case, it was me. It wasn't uh, some other female. Andreas Spizak, Melissa Harpst, Kelly Weeks, I think one other, and one particular, they're the, the central antagonist, Jessica Truesdale. How do you respond? If when they, for whatever reason, collaborate to make the decision to attempt to tear somebody down. Well, that's where it began. That was its origins until I figured out how to address it. Um, and that, that carried into ninth grade. Jamie Farrell pulled a Chernobyl you're watching it, you're just as, like, you know, you play. 
But for the longest time, though, it came the time, a period of time where I forgot about that. I, I discovered other things. I put that behind me. There have been so many, in, there have been periods where I had been able to, had things gone differently. When you discover a new thing or when I discover a new thing, I pour myself into it entirely and I forget about everything else. And I discovered passions and interests and that allowed me to do that. <clears throat> and beginning college, I was off in my own little world. But then when I was 21, I attempted to re-engage or actually engage <clears throat> college society and college life. And that included females as well. Uh, how they can justify the behavior that they, I'm, I'm not going to go too far into this, but because I could, I'm not, I don't, I want to be efficient with this. And this is leading somewhere. Why you can, how you can give your phone number to somebody when you already have a boyfriend. How many times have I, you, you have what? Why did you give me your phone number then? You know, oh, you know, I, I would like to think a 12 year old would know better, but you know, it's, more instances than I can recall and I for, I've allowed myself to forget about a lot of them but one I can't forget or a couple that I can't really forget during that period it's two females that I was working with this was one of this was I guess an intermediate rebirth I was working at a call center with them and I was interacting with both of them. I must have asked for the phone number of the one and, and she gave it to me. And I tried to call her on several occasions. I couldn't get through. I didn't know whether I was, but she told me where she worked in the boys club. I said, okay, I'll go say hi. <clears throat> I left a message. Can you tell so-and-so I stopped by? Next thing I get a phone call from the police. Oh, the What's going on with these girls? Like, why are you bothering me? Why, why is this a, a concern of yours? Again, this mentality, let's just run to the authorities when my our feelings are hurt. I've co I'd committed no wrong. I was just trying to court this particular female. I said, I'm just trying to hook up with this girl. It's, well, they, they've decided not to press charge. They've decided, really, have they? Well, thank them. I, I didn't ask what charges they could have pressed. But for me being aggressive, I, can I press charges against them being evasive? If you're going to press charges against a male characteristic, can I press charges against a female characteristic? I can't press charges for being evasive and being dishonest. Okay. Lauren Leander was another one. Made one date, didn't show up. Made another other date with, didn't show up. Kept making excuses. And, uh, I could have ripped her head off, but that was an intermediate. That's what I'm getting to ultimately. And I, I forgot about that for the longest time when I discovered the path when, well, something else, something of interest, something, a passion that I pursued and could <sighs> allow myself to selectively forget about unpleasant things. Although there were always instances, sometimes I was able to get even, sometimes not. I mean, legally get even. This is ultimately leading up to Amsterdam. <clears throat> and again, the, the, the treachery, what, the treachery that a female is capable of when her sensibilities are offended to me is astonishing. And why nobody else has emphasized it or addressed it is <clears throat> the lengths that they will go to lying, exaggerating, uh, outright lying. And again, and I, I stated this before, there were, there were eight of them. It wasn't like I offended. They all saw the exact same actions out of me. And the four dudes were like, Hey, you know, whatever guys, a little, little crazy, you know, or a little, 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 not even crazy, but a little, weird. I don't know what they, but not enough to take pen to paper and attempt to destroy me. The four that did,
are Lindsay Bly, Jennifer Abendroth, <clears throat> Heather King, and Leisha Gann. The last one was a captain. Where's the fraternization charge there? Four cunts. I hope you're watching. I hope you're... Treachery at its most vile. When you even... Not unintentionally stir up a pit of vipers that they can be. And this was a pit of vipers. <sighs> that is where... Malevolence can idle or it can manifest itself into something. I felt such malevolence. I still feel malevolence towards them, but have I been able to subjugate it? At the very least, they deserve to be emphasized and, and highlighted for their, their treachery. I believe treachery warrants identification. Things could have conceivably gone different. That was the latest rebirth. I, I was already thinking, how, how could things, how could this play out? Where is this particular avenue going? But without that spark plug of their venom and of their, your lies and exaggerations. And, I mean, congratulations. This is first and foremost on you. There's never any... What, what excuse ever is there for treachery? <clears throat> Someone that you didn't even know that was put their faith in you and I, I could use some companionship, some some friends in this town here. You're, you're all buddies with each other. I'm just some guy that is here hanging out. Well, he makes an easy victim then, doesn't he? No repercussions on our behalf, well, potentially. <clears throat> but I believe in karma. I believe in what what comes around goes around. And those that engage in in treachery ultimately will be the victims of it. Hopefully they've been hopefully there's been justice in some comparable regard that they've been the recipients of. People that in, do these sorts of things frequently end up you know, live by the sword, die by the sword, sort of. It's an analogy. But when you engage in certain nefarious things, frequently, I think, you end up being the recipient of those very sorts of, of actions. So that most likely, I'm going to imagine, is already the case. But if it isn't, well, I think I've, I've covered that to the extent that I wanted to. The next red flag incident emerged two years after those videos were uploaded. In June of 2016, while living at an apartment complex in Tallahassee, Florida, Scott approached a woman who was sunbathing by the swimming pool. He asked if she needed help applying sun cream to her body. She said that she didn't. In response to the rejection, he slapped, grabbed, and shook the woman's backside. Law enforcement were notified, and Scott was subsequently arrested and charged with battery. However, the charges were dropped after he agreed with a judge to take counseling sessions with a sex addiction therapist. It's to no surprise that Scott was kicked out of the apartment complex following the incident. And by September of 2016, he moved into a rented room in a single family home in Deltona, Florida. This ladies and gentlemen would be Scott's last place of residence. 
He was a loner. Although we spoke when we saw each other, I didn't really learn much about him because we didn't spend that much time together. He ate straight out of cans. I felt sorry for him, so I purchased him some proper food and clothes. He must have liked me because in hindsight, I think he would have killed me. Which leads us on to our last red flag incident. By 2017, Scott was struggling to find employment, but eventually he found himself some part-time work as a substitute teacher at a middle school in Florida. The role turned into full-time work just months later. To start, there was nothing to suggest that Scott's behavior towards anyone was alarming in any way, but that was all due to change. You see, just days after securing full-time employment, three sisters who attended the school told a parent and a school guidance counselor that Scott had made them feel uncomfortable. The girls reported that he would stare at female students and give them nicknames, and that Scott wouldn't act the same towards the male students. He was eventually fired for, quote, classroom performance issues just two weeks later. And even though female students had come forward to say that he was making them uncomfortable, the school board allowed him to continue as a substitute teacher. However, he decided to leave anyway. It's hard to say how long Scott had murder on his mind. If you really wanted to, you could trace the origin of those thoughts back to his school days. But when did he decide to act on these thoughts? Well, police say that the murder plot began in the summer of 2018. In June of that year, Scott goes on his computer and searches for a Panama City cheerleading camp. It isn't entirely clear why that was chosen specifically, but it's thought that the camp was his initial target. Over the next few weeks, Scott legally purchases a Glock from a pawn shop and travels to a shooting range 280 miles from his home. After leaving the range, he heads towards the cheerleading camp in Panama City. For reasons unknown, he decides not to attack the camp, rather goes online and searches for camps closer to his home. During this search, he also looks for a map of the area around hot yoga, Tallahassee. After spending three days in Panama City, Scott heads back to his home. Upon arrival, he decides to ditch his cheerleading camp plot and hot yoga becomes his primary target. For weeks, he researches different class schedules for hot yoga, more than likely to see when it's the busiest. On October 14th, Scott made a reservation at that hotel four minutes away from the yoga studio. On October 31st, he checks in. Scott stayed at the hotel from October 31st until November 2nd. It isn't entirely clear what he got up to during that period of time, but we do know that he didn't go near hot yoga. On November 2nd, 2018, Scott uploads a song titled Ephemal. The song depicts his frustration over his failures in life, including failed employment, relationships with women, and overall life goals. The hell with the boss, I won't get off my back. The hell with the girl, I can't get in the sack. The hell with the good times, I can't get back. The hell with my life, I can't get on track. Fuck them all. Fuck them all. Fuck them all. I used to have all these goals for myself, but now they're collecting dust on a shelf. I used to look at the world without fear, but now I'm stuck in this neutral gear. It all. It all. Get all. Get all. Get all. 
When every door is slammed in my face When I find myself in last place When all I hear all the time is no When all I feel is my frustration grow After the song was posted, he left the hotel and headed for hot yoga. At around 5.35pm on November 2nd, 2018, Scott began shooting at participants who attended the 5.30pm yoga class at Hot Yoga. The gun used was the Glock pistol he purchased from the pawn shop. 61-year-old doctor, Dr. Nancy Van Vessem, and 21-year-old Maura Binkley, a student at Florida State University, were killed instantly. Five others were injured. As the initial shots were being fired, some participants ran and huddled in a corner. Shortly after, there was a moment of silence. This was due to Scott's Glock jamming on him. Joshua Quick, one of those who was huddled in the corner, decided he would spring into action and try to wrestle the gun off Scott to help save lives. The yoga instructor uh, walked over to assist him or do something and that's when I heard her scream. I looked up and I do not recall this, but I, told I, I was told that I yelled, he's got a gun. The only thing that was there that I could think of was this vacuum with a heavy end. And I, uh, so as soon as he came around the corner, the gun stopped. I used that opportunity, I hit him over the head with it. Next thing I know, I'm grabbing a broom, you know, anything I can, and I hit him again. Saying a situation could have been prevented is a rare occurrence, but in my opinion, this could have been prevented. I mean, some of Scott's red flag incidents wouldn't have suggested he would go on to murder, but it was clear that he had a hatred for women, and authorities should have at least been monitoring his activities. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, they had the chance to do exactly that. You see, just three months before the shooting, when he came back from Panama City in early August 2018, he had shared a website he created with a buddy of his. The website was filled with misogynistic content, including some of his own work. His friend's wife was that concerned by what she had witnessed. She gave a link to the website to the FBI, along with Scott's details, but the FBI deemed the tip non-actionable. According to an FBI source, they claimed that even though, for example, violently themed lyrics appeared on the site, it was considered protected speech. You see, because he didn't target a particular person, place, or event, they couldn't do anything about it. In my opinion, had they done something about it, this situation more than likely would have been prevented. 